everybody um, to the panel. Um, really, really excited to welcome Four Arrows, to welcome Edgard, to welcome Adler Young, and uh, unfortunately, Phoebe, who was supposed to join us in the session, is unable to be here due to a funeral of a very close uh, family member. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to call in four arrows to bring in an invocation or a prayer to set the grounding for the session today. Thank you, Rufingo. And I just want to briefly open with uh, some words in a Lakota tradition to talk about how we're all here because we recognize our interconnectedness, that we know it's difficult to walk on this, this road of balance and that we have respect for all of our sentience and life around us. We're all related. We're all related. I share because I'm from Agu. Thank you so much for bringing spirit into the session as we are reimagining research and the spirit should certainly be at the center of that. And perhaps as we ground into the session and in order to introduce each of our panelists, I'd just like to ask the question, what is searching for you at this moment? And uh, perhaps for Arrows, since uh, you brought us into the invocation, what is searching for you? Well, for, for me, it's this idea that we've got to make a distinction between information and truth. And that we're in a time of, of great, great imbalance that is not about human nature being bad, as some people say. I know maybe 25 years ago, I used to think we were a cancer to the planet. And I'm so sorry that I thought that because we are creatures of Mother Earth like all other creatures. But we're malleable. Our human nature is good, but we're malleable. And the information that hypnotizes us into the insanities that are happening in Gaza and elsewhere are what we have to get in touch with. And we can only get in touch with that by knowing ourselves as related to all, all sentience, the trees, the animals, the birds, recognizing an interconnectedness is, I think, the beginning. And that means decolonizing our settler colonial worldview. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are all related. We are malleable. Edgard, what is searching for you at this moment? Well, again, feeling so glad to be here with everybody. I don't know, some good good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm actually in, in, a, in a researching time for, for myself. So I would say like research for me, it looks like uh, three words, like imagination, uh, imagination, intuition, and reconnection, uh, or deep connection with nature again. Uh, basically because of, so the future we can explore it a, li a little bit uh, more later, but both from the whole, uh, how, how speed the AI is growing in my country as well, in Brazil, well, everywhere, and how it's like already affecting people, the possibilities of that. So I'm uh, kind of trying to think about research as what, what else could be as stronger, stronger than that. That's why intuition, imagination. So it's part of my, my, uh, yeah, my walk nowadays. And reconnection is more. It's more alive. Is that I just uh, decided, okay, like if I didn't have to anything, if I didn't have to save humanity or nature or myself, or if everything was okay, it was a, it was a question that a friend of mine she raised a few years ago. I say, Edge guy, if you didn't have to anything, what? And that question was kind of alive with me like for more than 20 years now. And then I finally decided, okay, like if I didn't have to do anything and I, she didn't give me the chance to think anything to do, 
anything to be, just say anything. You don't have to do anything. What? And this open question. And I found myself like reconnecting with nature. I was in Indonesia a few months ago. And suddenly I found myself floating. Uh, this, this reconnection is about how can I reintegrate with my childhood. If it is, so when I, I start to be a, a, an activist, uh, when 12, with 12 years old, right? And since then, I was always trying to save someone and protect someone and take care of someone, like someone else, mostly. And now I just think about, okay, like what if I could just be myself, uh, the best of myself, if I could serve like that. And when I was trying to look for the ways of doing that, I reconnected with elders, trying to find people, the more wise people, and finally, I was I found myself floating, and floating for two hours, no stopping, and that was a a, a big channel for me to think. Okay, that's another source for research. And then I realized that I remind remind myself that when I was a child, I used to do that not for two hours, but for maybe one hour, by myself. Uh, and then I realized, okay, this is a way of reconnecting. That there's a lot of information, a lot of information just by being floating, like just by sitting there and saying, oh, there, in order to float well, you, you can do anything. If you try to think, you're going to sink. If you try to move, whatever, you just have to surrender. And suddenly to open a door for so many formations or so many other things that's more related with truth, like Aaron said, that that's my, how, it, how I seeing researching right now, like going back to roots, nature, and uh, imagination, intuition. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Edgar. And finally, um, Adler, what's what's searching for you at this moment as we introduce you? You're on mute, Adler. I think you're on mute. So, um, actually. I, I've been reflecting on a very recent experience. Uh, roughly three weeks ago, I caught a cold after a long time, working for a long time without break. Uh, however, at the same time, I had a major uh, gover governance research project deadline that I had to meet. So I, I couldn't really rest at the time. And the following week, uh, while I'm uh, recovering. My my mom also fell ill because of overworking, um, and I went home to take care of her. And um, while having a pretty packed schedule ahead, like in Japan, awaiting me today in 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 the conference that I attended, it was a materialist conference uh, in Japan. And people were talking about um, the challenges of care that we that many people, I think, including us, would agree that care is important. But why is it so difficult? Um, reflecting these experiences that I just recently had, I realized that when I was with my mom taking care of her, I feel I feel the love. And also, I actually also enjoy the process because I was able to uh, do acupressure for her, do gua sha, twina, these traditional East Asian uh, therapies for her. And I think it's a it's a both healing process for her and myself. However, uh, the difficulty might not arise from the inconvenience of care itself. Rather, the momentum, the momentum that is set upon us, uh, given our current system of operation, that we've lost a way to to survive based on our um, interaction with Mother Nature, uh, or to use a more um, more technical or might be more theoretical term we we cannot we cannot directly met metabolize uh with earth however we we are we are limited to metabolize uh to revitalize to recontinue our life 
through our reliance on money system and so on. So I think um, what is certain to me is that these important values such as care or many other values that we we have been talking in this community and what we will be talking, they are there very deep in us. Uh, but also how do we recognize the systemic challenges uh, that um, we are hmm, we're being folded or being packed or being covered with the current mechanism? What are the current mechanisms that we, we live in and how might we break through those modern industrial um, artificial mechanisms and reconnect with that, the, those important values interconnected deep inside us is something I think it's certain and I'd love to explore with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to our three panelists for grounding of it is around relativity, it's around uh, care, it's about intuition, it's about connectedness. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll share what's what's alive for me at the moment, what's searching for me. Uh, and uh, what's searching for me at the moment is knowledge. Knowledge contemplates and calculates a better course for today's tomorrow, innovative paths for minds to follow. It seeks to sustain and thus maintain the natural order of life's terrain. Knowledge seeks truth in its becoming. Knowledge in wisdom's hands creates knowing. Yet used unwisely, knowledge dominates and desecrates. With mounting greed, it separates and segregates. It fractures land and drowns the seed, curtails the thoughts and then the deed. It dams the rivers of life for power. It stops the flow of the cosmic heartbeat's flower. Knowledge expands in its production, yet constricts, restricts in its destruction. Knowledge vacillates, oscillates, reverberates. Knowledge has a jagged edge. Thus, if it is not to build bridges between the hearts of peoples, why do we know? If not to dry the tears of war's wounded children, then why should we know? If it is not to create in harmony with the creators created, then why would we know? If it is not to build temples in the desert sand, not to bring peace unto troubled minds of masses or heal the pain that death surpasses, if not to know our place in time's vast space, then why should we know? Knowledge seeks the leader in all our hearts. It seeks the custodians that were kept apart. It seeks the masters of wisdom's alchemy. Knowledge seeks the sage in our common destiny. Knowledge keeps an open mind so it can discover. It keeps an open heart so life can recover. It yearns to illuminate the clouds of darkness, bring to light that which can be conceived. It seeks to clear the paths of murky waters to bring truth to that which was deceived. Through curves and twists and fragged edges, to sinews, depths, enlightened mergers, in multiple disciplines and directions, the journey of knowledge, a jagged road. We welcome all those who have joined us here today, where we're in the conversation with Four Arrows, with Edgard and Adler, about reimagining research. And I'd like to throw the question back into the room to our panelists and really why? Why? Why do we need to reimagine research? And what ways are you reimagining research in your context? And perhaps I'll give it to our elder or Arrows to kick us off with that. Well, you know, when we talk about research, I cannot help but think about my doctoral dissertation for my second doctorate at Boise State University uh, on indigenous worldview and uh, education and curriculum. And uh, I was waiting for my 
my document to be returned to me and you know I had turned it in and the research faculty had finally put it into my box and I with great anticipation picked it up opened the first page and it said please see me in my office this is either brilliant or bullshit and I was shocked by that I was I, I, I how could he think it was it was the latter, and, and I was surprised that it could possibly be the former. Well, over time, of course, I managed to get through it, but it was because my doctoral dissertation was based on a vision that I had in a near-death experience, attempting to kayak a river in Mexico. And I, and I had empathy. Well, no wonder the academic of the Western world is not going to see knowledge and a vision. They're not going to accept a doctoral dissertation based on a vision without that kind of skepticism. Well, it took him about a year to, to write me a letter saying, okay, so it's not, it's not, you know, the, the latter. Um, and I think until we bring spirituality into our critical pedagogy, our research, we're going to continue to fall short until we get to understand how spirituality, and I define it from an indigenous perspective as a sacred respect for all and to all beings. And, uh, and, and with that respect and, and with some of the other worldview precepts that we have lost in our fundamental worldview because of the worldview of a colonial. I'd like to just for a moment share my screen to show you the worldview precepts that I'm talking about. So in this non-dualistic contrasting moral precepts that are manifested in our institutions of education, uh, religions, sports, media, you know, you name it, that the manifestations generally are on the right side of this chart. They're generally about rigid hierarchy, fear-based thoughts, focus on self and personal gain, and, and, you know, these kinds of things, seeing Earth as an unloving it, emphasis on possessions, as opposed to how we did it all starting 9,000 years ago, for sure, for about 99% of human history where we were egalitarian, et cetera. Well, one of the things in here is I, unless you scan through it, that I'd like to just talk about briefly is number 28. That idea of trance-based learning, or let's use the word hypnosis, is either in, in most of the Abrahamic religions, it's of the devil. and uh, in, in, in science, it's, it's accepted, but rarely does it get into uh, anything beyond trying to make money out of it or using it for entertainment. The idea of self-hypnosis, mass hypnosis, was deeply understood by indigenous peoples who maybe they did not know about lower brain, brainwave frequencies and the concept of imagination, but they knew if they wanted to be more generous, if they wanted to emphasize becoming fully human, uh, honoring all forms of diversity, high respect for women, all of these things, we did ceremony. Because ceremony, in effect, is a trance-based learning phenomenon. And this idea of recognizing how, from a metacognitive perspective, why do we believe and how do we believe the things that are getting us into this trouble and and are they are they really based on fear uh, and and from a perspective of dominant colonialism as opposed to the indigenous approach to fear which sees once fight or flight is taken care of then it's all about um, and I'll stop the screen sharing now uh, it's all it's all about um, using fear to practice a virtue such as patience or or fortitude, or humility, or generosity, or, or courage. Um, and so 
understanding this idea of how we can transform, even with our best ideas, that we are, we are, we move our actions based on uninvestigated ideas that have come to us uh, during times of stress. Because during times of stress, we know we become hyper suggestible to the communication of a perceived trust of authority figure. So we're essentially in that state of receptivity for the first five years of life. Many of our problems come back from the beliefs that we, we understood then, but also many come from stress and trauma. And, um, and so, you know, the, 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 I write about this in, in, in a book called uh, uh, Hypnotic Communication in Medical Emergency Settings, but we are in an emergency medical setting essentially everywhere now. And so those principles in the books would, would, would apply. And the idea of self-hypnosis is essentially saying that it's something that is natural. I learned it from wild horses. If anybody goes to YouTube and puts in wild horse hypnotist, you'll see how that happens. So begin to think about why do I believe what I think? Why does my comrade, why does my relative, why does my organization do this? What was the foundational belief system? And, and so getting to Ritendo's beautiful poem about how knowledge can go in these different directions, but how it's supposed to be. Um, and, ma and making, I make a, a distinction, by the way, between place-based knowledge of indigenous cultures, that you have to know the language fluently, the ceremonies fluently, have to have been there for many generations knowing the flora and fauna. And of course, that's getting more and more rare. We've got to fight for it, for, for it. Through our, uh, our organization, provensustainable.org, we're, we're bringing people to realize how contemporary maroon uh, uh, peoples and, and indigenous peoples are proving sustainable. The United Nations Biodiversity Report the largest study on biodiversity ever in 2019, 15,000 peer-reviewed papers, 450 uh, research scientists. They say in that report where our indigenous worldview was op is operating and able to manage the land, the extinction rate is severely reduced or absent. And we talk about this on our website, Proven Sustainable. So um, I want to invite everybody to participate in this worldview literacy project. You simply put in worldviewliteracy.org and download that worldview chart for free that you just saw, and then uh, make a commitment to use it in whatever way you think might work. And that's what we're wanting to find out in our study and come back in three months and fill out our questionnaire. So think about this idea of trance-based learning and how if you stop to think, okay, what, what am I afraid of? On whose authority do I have this belief? And should I investigate it further? What words do I use when I talk to myself about, about things? And am I rehypnotizing myself with those words? And then in what way have I used observation of nature? Even if I'm in a city, you can study a leaf growing out of a crack in the sidewalk or a pigeon on the side, or an ant in the kitchen, and learn. That's how we used to learn. It's from the other than human, or as David Abrams says, greater than human life forces. So I want to put that out there for, for everyone to think about how research has to re understand the hypnotic effect. Research has to understand this uh, in, 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 emphatic necessity for a spiritual perspective of interconnectedness. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for bringing us back into that state of confidence where learning actually happens and where research needs to, to, to re-enter uh, into. Um, Edgard, same questions for you. You know, why do we need to uh, reimagine research? 
So, um, for in, in my field, like for the last thirty years, I'm working a lot with playfulness. Or actually, not working, but playing in playfulness, especially collective playfulness, um, in a way to unleash or to unlock the the best version of ourselves. We used to say that we used to say that we have like all of us, we have an ordinary version and an extraordinary version. And the ordinary version is not bad. The, 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 the version of yourself that you know, you know that I'm able to deliver that, I'm able to do that, I'm seeing like that, you know. Uh, but we know that we have like, most of us, I'd say like all of us, we have in a certain moment of our lives, we we reach it, a moment, they say like, oh my gosh, that, that's not me. <laughs> Or people are clapping you or like in awe with you. They say, you're like, no, that's not possible, right? Or you are maybe in a stage like uh, throwing a, 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 a speech, amazing speech, or singing, or maybe dancing a party, or maybe just by moving and people will look at you and you feel like they're seeing something special that you could recognize. Anyway, that was is what I say, our extraordinary version. So we all have that. So that moment in your life is like, oh my God, how I did that, right? But I'm very interested in when we are we have that collectively, when we all together, a group of people, a whole neighborhood, uh, you know, a whole city, sometimes a whole nation, we reach that potential. And that's really, really powerful to solve many of the issues or the questions that you have. So I'm particularly inter interested in that kind of uh, unleashed power. We have a saying in our group, in our collective, we say like, what if, what if building the world of our dreams could be fast, free, fun, and fantastic. What if building the world of our dreams, the best of our imagination, what if doing that, make it become true, could be fast, free, fun, and fantastic? And those four apps, they are very particular one. Like they have some, you know, like uh, there's not just a word. Like it's like when do we when do we mean like when when we design that, what if it could be free? Some for example, when I go, for example, to a favela in Brazil, a very dilapidated community, right? And I go there and I say like, well, what are your dreams? Like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna hear your problems. What are your dreams? So, what, what do you mean that you got? We are poor, like poor people, we don't dream. So no, 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 you dream. Go ahead, like, you tell me the, your dreams, right? And then I have a particular way of doing that, like having, make some fun, some jokes, and then finally, some are brave enough and release their dreams. So we go for the higher dreams, because, you know, just one dream, it fulfills many issues, many problems. So I don't want to hear your problems. I have a lot. You know, it gives something like exciting us. When you share your dreams, it's exciting for everybody. And then I say like, okay, we have three weeks to make this dream become true. It's not allowed to use money. It has to be free. When I tell them it has to be not allowed to use money, they don't have money. But it doesn't matter because I invite them to say, it's not, you're not allowed to use money. They, they start smile straight away. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? Yeah, it has to be free. When they do that, you not you, you instantly you unlock the power of creativity, the power of collabor collaboration among them. Because then they start the kind of, the kind of open heart. They, they they donate. Okay, I have some bricks here. I have some grass. I can you know. Sometimes the dreams is to, to build a kindergarten for the kids that are waiting for twenty five years for the government to do it, and they never go there. And then somebody I tell them, I'm telling them, I tell, I'm giving them a challenge that they have to do by themselves for free with no money within three weeks. That's been impossible. It like, looks like impossible. So it's a kind of community community challenge. When you do that, a, a, a hidden or uh, powerful uh, source of energy just is unleashed, unlocked. Because they go into the mood of play. And maybe even you're not being Brazilian, so maybe the best way of uh, uh, exp explain that for example, you, you, maybe most of you, you know about the carnival in Brazil, right? Or you've heard about the carnival in Brazil. It's a huge festival, the whole nation, does it, right? And the people, but even here in Brazil, we don't think about that. The the people that build the carnival, it's one of the most luxurious festival all around the world. It's big. It's very luxurious. Golden, the circus. It's, it's really amazing if you go to Google some images. But the people that do build the, those festivals, they are the most poor people in Brazil. They live in favelas. Right nowadays, the last 20, 30 years, they receive some 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 uh, uh, some support from money from from the government because it's an amazing touristic you know destination. But before that, 
just a favela themselves, they create this amazing. So how far the, the, the uneducated people, they don't go to school, they don't have school at the time, they don't have any money, and really no kind of intelligence like created, but they build the most luxurious festival all around the world. People from everywhere, the royal families, they just come to Brazil, the best artists, they come to watch them to see that. Just once and once a year. So where that comes from, which kind of power do that? Which kind of power creates from, from African diaspora, from black diaspora, was able to create rock and roll or jazz or blues or whatever. You know, we all know song, we all know we appreciate and we buy for it. That's a huge economy of black music that came from slavery, from a deep, deep, deep pain. But now I'm not talking about the, the, the sad songs, but this, the, the songs that make us shake, make us vibe, make us laugh, you know, and celebrate. They come from very deep, deep source of, of, of darkness, right? Anyway, I'm very interested in seeing like how they were able to use, that's what I mean, I mean about playfulness. Where they, they, those, those, this part of humanity were able from that place to playfulness, to joy, to connection, to move your body, create something that, that is able to move bodies everywhere, everywhere, transculturally. Right, all other in Japan, they 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 samba. Right in China, so we all enjoy that in rock. So there's this big power there that comes from me. There's many other sources, but for particularly my uh, focus is playfulness. The idea that we can use that to rebuild a lot of the style that was like okay, bro broken to reconnect again to the source of life for ourselves, life of connecting and so on. So each one of those apps are a very particular different stuff. Like when, I'm, when I say you, you, you have to have fun, you're not, allowed, you're not allowed to work hard, you're not allowed to suffer. You have to, you know, whatever, whatever happens, the rules of the game is fast, free, fun and fantastic, right? So this one, <coughs> one of the places that I'm, I'm doing that. So, and I realized how can we design narratives? How can we create stories? A competing, uh, 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 unbeatable, uh, inevitable invitations or callings that people cannot say no. For example, building a kindergarten within two weeks with no money, like people say, okay, I don't have time, but for two weeks I, I can I can dedicate something. I, I want to be part of it, right? Or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's one one of my my particular uh, focus in in research and how to unleash. I say, what. What are the topics or the values or the tricky stairs that are able to dissolve so many years or actually centuries of education, of being trained or even tamed into idea that we don't know, you know, someone else knows, you know, we don't know enough, we are not enough, we don't have enough. And then you have to tame yourself to follow some systems. So where are the sources that we don't need to read? I love the idea that we don't, you don't need to, to teach again, right? We know that, we are that, it's still alive, totally alive. Like if you allow kids to play, they naturally learn. When they're playing, they're, they're researching all the time. You don't need to teach them how to research. Let them free, we know adults around. They're gonna research everything, they're gonna learn everything and they're gonna share everything. They're gonna create collective learnings and, and, and knowledge. So how can we find ways, doors, like magic doors, fast doors for us to unleash this natural power of humanity and more and more than that nature. So next, I, the, the second uh, branch of my, my, my research are about nature. So when I told that I was floating, so I, now I'm floating everywhere and I'm finding amazing place to floating for now my, my record was now three hours and I have no idea what starts happening after 40 minutes floating. I really, you should try it. Go for a safe place, a shallow beach, whatever, but you know, the currents are not there. There's no way, uh, risk of sharks or whatever. But when, you, when you're floating for after 40 minutes, something unleash and cover. And this idea of being totally in the hands of nature, that you feel like in the hands of the planet, of Earth, again, we connect this, uh, dissolving this idea of humanity and nature that put us apart, like this idea, this crazy idea of created of that we are man, humankind, and nature there. When you're able to go back to that, there's a source of a source of knowledge, 
a source of information, a source of connection that allows us to go back and try to redesign ways of uh, walking in this planet or dancing together and celebrate life as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing in playfulness and unleashing the power inherent in us and, uh, or of course, the floating in nature. Adler, same question to you. Why should we reimagine research? Um, can I hear you? Um, He's you asked me to play a video. Can you so I can, right oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me right now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to share a short video, uh, a actually a trailer of my documentary, and uh, start my story from there. Are you able to hear the video? Hello 一位我小同學他跟一位師長在對話師長問他在一年之後你就要考高中了你們想過你想要去什麼樣的高中他說他能考上什麼學校就算什麼學校的啊我不断思考在成障碍的时候你就会发现你真的非常有能力专注于读书考试的学习环境就是忠实的记录下你们到底改变了什么经历了七年的拍摄一个二十出头的某种少年
就是比较容易比较什么建筑师、什么设计师、设计家，很多人都。Okay, so so the reason why I wanted to share this trailer with you is because, um, so it's now, um, this trailer is was done eight years ago, and the story I shared about my um primary school classmate was already fifteen years ago, but that that experience was really a turning point to me, uh, also in terms of research. Originally, um, when I was a, when I was still a primary school student, I wanted to become a medical doctor because I can't stand people in pain. And also I, I learned that uh, my, fam my, my family on my father's side has uh, um, a family history of cardiovascular disease. But um, at that moment, meeting my primary school classmates, I had an epiphany moment. I realized that um, the, the sufferings, the pains that we experience in the world, where do they arise? They arise from our incapability, our inability to harmoniously coexist with nature, to coexist harmoniously with society, with others, and with ourselves. So even we are entitled with such a regenerative abundance from nature, we deplete it in, so, in such a short time and even at an increasingly faster pace. Um, most of us during our young year, in our, in our youth, we would see, we would see that there are so many injustices in society and we want to change we want to change that system but but um as we grow up we recognize that uh more often than not more often than not we become accomplices of the system so often that we feel that we love others however through that love how often are we harming others? And also, oftentimes we think, um, we're, I'm just doing what I want to do or what I like to do, but is that really uh, something that's the most healthiest or the most regenerative or the most genuine, authentic thing that we are able to do? And all of these uh, comes back to the way, as I said, we coexist or co-become with the world and ourselves. And the formation of the ways of coexisting or co-becoming is education in a broad sense. And unfortunately, uh, oftentimes not schooling or, or, or in the opposite way, I would say, the schooling, schooling has been a process of Deharmonizing that um, our coexisting or co-becoming process for the world, and and authentic or genuine healing, I think from that epiphany, I realized that it's not just about healing the wounds or healing specific illness or even symptoms uh, that medical doctors heal. Of course, I'm not denying. Uh, the contribution, but that the true healing or the genuine healing should come from the our healing our ways of coexisting and becoming. And again, coming back to our our topic today, research. So the question then becomes, how do we, um, how do we harmoniously coexist, co-become the world with the world and ourselves? And if 
the ways that we coexist and co-become um, has been um, um, alienating or has been um, has been unhealthy. Why is that the case? So that that question has uh, guided my research for throughout 15 years, and I believe it's a long lifelong lifelong quest that will not end. Um, from that documentary, uh, that seven year journey doing that documentary, I realized that um, the the problems we see in the schooling system maybe isn't just about education. Um, so roughly roughly a couple of years as I began document documenting my friends and also doing more research on the problems with education, I came to realize that the filtering process in schooling or the school system uh, shares similar patterns with so many world crises. We see filtering happening in inequality, economic inequality. We also see um, filtering happening in the, pow uh, the power structure in our social political uh, systems. We also see um, that the filtering, I'm, I'm abbreviating, summarizing, because it's, it's a, it's a hu hu huge, huge topic, but I can elaborate later. I see that filtering and also the hierarchy that arises from the inequality and the hierarchy that arise from that filtering also happens in health and also the filtering also, um, the pattern also happens in our environmental systems, our human human interaction with environmental systems. And uh, having these important insights, I thought uh, is a very important research uh, 10 years ago already. However, when I, when I, uh, sought assistance or advice uh, from uh, researchers, professors. They say, no, you're not doing research. What's your research question? That's too big. Uh, what, what's, what's your research topic? Um, and where, who, like, who are your informants or like, what are your variables? <laughs> what are the hypotheses that you're going to test? Basically, they deny that that's research and uh, I should uh, work on it um, from scratch all all over, and and whatever I said would ju was just consider some personal musings or maybe uh, anecdotes. So later I entered university, and I even went to um, the so-called top university, most selective uh, among the like universities around the world. But even worse, when I got there, uh, I found that um, the not only the practice of research itself, like the, my encounters with these established researchers and scholars denied why I did, why I did was research. Um, I also realized that I cannot do research as a grad as a undergrad student, I'm supposed to, what I'm supposed to do in un, during undergrad is not to directly do research, but to be broadly familiar with the discipline uh, that basically the major I choose. And then eventually when I go to my master's, I will become familiar with the specific field I, I choose. And finally, during doctoral level, I will finally identify gaps in the literature to be filled. And um, to me, I, when I entered co college, I wanted to do research, but I was there was no space for me to do research. And even if I tried to do research in a scientific way, uh, the way that we learn research methods, it's in a capital, capitalized form, uh, AKA like scientific method in the capital S. So as just like the researchers or the professors I met, they would say that, okay, so the scientific method requires you to develop hypotheses, te test hypotheses, and let's say what's the confidence interval and all that and all that. 
um, and also importantly, the teach an important part of the education research education is to tell you how do how do you distinguish science with non science or worse pseudoscience. So of course, in that uh, distinguishing or demarcation problem, <laughs> in that process. Uh, first of all, you, you filter out in the indigenous wisdom, whatever you call it, or um, I, in our case studies, uh, we even had a case study saying why traditional East Asian medicine is pseudoscience, why psychoanalysis is pseudoscience, um, and and even in a, in some 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 people, especially in the hard hard natural sciences, they would say that oh no. Um, social science is just semi semi science, and humanities is not science. So there, uh, you see, there there's a hierarchy of sciences. Some of them are more perfect, and some are are um, acceptable, but not as perfect. And some are just basically excluded. And also, we learn that why the why questions, for example, why does life exist, uh, and so on. These are not concerns of uh, science. These are concerns of your personal choice. These are concerns of theology or um, ideologies. These are not science, and science are concerned with uh, what or how questions. So, um, originally, it um, all these uh, not not just the research practice itself, but also research education. Um, it was. Uh, how should I put it? I I feel very alienated, uh, but only after many years of self-education, including familiariz familiarizing myself with uh, mainstream and some of the more uh, progressive or maybe radical uh, research methodologies, and in, in uh, and uh, eventually uh, philosophies of science. I later, and also, of course, sociology and sociology, economics, and history of science, then I learned that. So the, the idea that uh, our, edu our higher education, uh, the way that higher education teaches research, uh, the disciplinary way um, actually has a quite arbitrary um, foundation or arbitrary um, history in the sense that the disciplines are only some uh, of the legitimate ways of categorizing knowledge, but not the only way of categorizing those. However, um, as these disciplines become so formalized, um, they become frames of they become frames of thinking. They frame the way we think. However, in the real world, these pre-existing frames may not exist. And from that, we see many problems in academia that the academics themselves are also uh, increasingly becoming aware of. For example, like the silification or the fragmentation of uh, scientific knowledge. And also, <laughs> um, these knowledge become inherently alienated from the real problems or challenges we face in the world and we are suffering from an endemic of irrelevance in the ivory tower. These are the these are the challenges that many academics are facing, and also we see that uh, evident in the devaluation of uh, these academic credentials around the world. Also, the scientific capitalized scientific method it it produces a very impoverished knowledge like the mono agriculture we see in our lives. And just like the mono agricultural agriculture we experience in our lives, um, the capitalized scientific method is suit for mass production, but the nutrition in each extra unit that is produced through that process is very limited, unfortunately. Um, so this experience, I think, um, shows this this experience shows why fringe about reimagining research is important and how do i deal with these challenges i think 
uh, it is through my self self education. And fortunately, there are there are enlightened people in the academia. Uh, there are very important thought leaders. Uh, one of the one of the liberations I had was reading how fire fire events everything goes. Throughout his through his his uh, uh, study on the history of science, uh, for example, for those who did not know him, um, he showed that if, for example, we we usually say that Galileo uh, and uh, yeah Galileo and um, other uh, peers of his time marked uh, the advent of modern science, but uh, through his research, he realized that had Galileo followed the strict capitalized scientific method, uh, his paradigm shift would not have happened. It is through a lot of uh, the so-called non-scientific accidents, trials and errors, and even, for example, tricks like Galileo, uh, while many people at the time they published in Latin, Galileo published in the local language, uh, utilizing uh, the printing press uh, invention during the time. There are so many other, so many other factors that influenced uh, Gal Galileo scientific discovery. So, I think, of course, there are many other, many other liberating learnings throughout that process. For example, learning. Uh, system thinking, system theory, or complexity, com complexity science, or other philosophies of science uh, through decolonization or critical realism, pragmatism. There are so many like these uh, big terms, but I'll set those aside. Uh, in terms of how I research right now throughout that long. Um, long self education i think it's a it's really a pity that um the, the the research right that i do right now it's not too different it's not too different from the insights that i shared uh, but denied by the mainstream researchers and scott and professors 10 years ago uh it's a pity that i had to take a detour nobody could really uh, teach or device, uh, supervise my research, and I had to take such a long process to justify that what what I do is research. But uh, through this self education process, I also become more um, more at ease or more uh, how should I put it like more co like basically co become with the research in more embodied in the research process and i let method or justification emerge from my deep inquiry or in other words uh let the subject matter or let the uh let the thing that i research whether it's the structure or or the dynamics of the things i research inform how should it be formalized or justified. And in terms of what I research right now, it's still it's still the general question I had in the right now if I communicate with the academic uh if, oh this is another trick I can sh share is that um given that I through this self-education reading a lot of different paradigms and those also these uh narratives um, depending on which community I communicate with, I use their language to communicate my uh, research. So, for example, right now I might I might uh, communicate more with the Marxist uh, people. Uh, then I will talk about what are the common structures behind uh, global crises. Uh, that 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 might be a, a Marxist language, but if I'm in a uh, like for example, network research, and then I would say network of whatever it goes. But anyway, it's still about um, what are the common underlying mechanisms that deteriorates us from um, harmonious coexistence and co-becoming, and what are some possible ways of systemic 
systematic transformation through personal transformation. And the, the filtering patterns I observed 10 years ago has become um, a working theory that I've already published in academic articles in Japan and also in a couple of international um, conferences. Uh, I think fortunately, after I learned their language and also know how to present present my work to them in language accepted about to them. I call it allocation dependence. Basically, I see that uh, the students, um, it's interesting that the students in my alternative school, um, they had to, they, they took, they went back to the highly competitive um, system because they feel that they have to be responsible for life Ironically, since the self self directed education teaches them to be responsible, so to be responsible, they need to make high grades so they can get better resources from educational institutions. I'm trying to wrapping up. I know that, and I spend a lot of time, and um, because the better they the better they fit in the allocation criteria, the better resource they receive, and this is actually. Uh, observable across disciplines. For example, like international relations, we can see that uh, the so-called developing countries trying to fit in the IMF's criteria in order to get aid or the support for development. And we can also even see this in human-animal relations that those animals that fit in human allocation criteria of resources or security, uh, they become domesticated, while those do not fit in, they, they become endangered. So this is a, a transdisciplinary result from that 15 years of self-education, fortunately getting uh, attention, increasingly attention from the mainstream. And regarding um, the reimagining educate uh, reimagining research part i'm also looking into non-western philosophies of science in particular traditional east and eastern medicine for example we learned that where does where where does the discovery where did the discovery of meridians come from it comes from uh deep deep self-reflective awareness how how might we re-enlighten ourselves so we might make such methods through mindfulness and so on to be to become research methods again and also looking into alternative higher education for example the practices across the alliance in terms of how research education is possible i think i'll wrap up here for my first response thank you thank, thank you so much Adler. thank you for those powerful reflections on your 15 year journey and specifically how to reharmonize our coexisting and co-becoming with the world. Um, we have another 25 minutes and uh, if there are any questions I encourage you to put them in the chat um, so that our panelists um, may uh, respond to any thoughts or musings or why you're here or what ideas you have towards reimagining research um, here at this reimagining education uh, conference. Um, I see a question in the chat for me from, from um, Four Arrows, and uh, I think uh, maybe a question I had wanted to put to the panel as we're waiting for other questions was, you know, in a reimagined uh, research paradigm, you know, what would ethics look like? And I, I asked this because um, I have um, an, an abandoned uh, PhD. And the reason I abandoned it was because I, uh, I was, as Adler was saying, following the uh, normal ways of doing research and um, able to research um, indigenous knowledge holders around medical paradigms. And uh, this one um, uh, indigenous knowledge holder um, before uh, answering my question, um, asked um, a person I had just met to take me to a number of places in a very, very mystical part of Zimbabwe, which is the country which I was born in. And the first was that I had to go to a waterfall and uh, a sacred waterfall and interact you know, with that, uh, that sacred waterfall. 
that interaction almost led to my being uh, taken in by water spurts. And I was, uh, had to be uh, funneled out before I uh, was taken underwater because um, with indigenous knowledge from an African indigenous paradigm, uh, many times our knowledge comes not just from the head, but it comes from the spirits that live deep below, below the waters. And what he said to me was, if anybody had cried for you, you would never have returned. From there on, I was taken on, on many, many hair-raising um, experiences in the mountains and the caves, passing landmines, um, you know, deep uh, in the shadows. And by the end of it, I realized that before I had the right to ask a single question, to the uh, to the elders um, about indigenous knowledge uh, systems, about indigenous medical paradigms, they had to research me, and I had to get permission from the river. I had to get permission from the waterfall. I had to get permission from the moon. I had to get permission from the mountains, from the caves. I had to get permission from all of these places before I had the right to even ask that research question, and that is where my research promptly fell apart. So I think that is the question that I'd like to put to, um, to our panel today is, uh, is in this reimagined world where the trance state is considered, um, you know, as a valid and authentic way of, of bringing forth knowledge in this reimagined world where playfulness is, uh, is, uh, is valid in this reimagined world where we are harmonizing with coexistence and co-being. What is the ethic? And I'll put that out. Well, I'll just jump in with regard to indigenous research and you know and, and the ethical components of it. They do begin with nature. Um, and they do begin with prayer, with ceremony, with asking the spirits. Um, my visit recently with the uh, the Kogi, you don't you don't walk across a certain uh, boundary line into their land until you sit down with one of their mamos and uh, and they will put a, a string, a small piece of of uh, metal in it on both wrists to remind you of the solar lunar balance, and then you carry that for the rest of your time there. Um, so they're bringing spirit into it is 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 primary and Spirit being the recognition of spiritual energies that are in all things. But then also is the after the research ethics, the importance of sharing what you learn with the people that help you learn it is crucial. Uh, going and 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 making sure that that all of the research has been done in a way that is honorable and respectful and helpful um, when possible giving that research to the others so that they can make changes in it and directions in it um i had earlier made a, a distinction between this place-based knowledge uh, and these traditions and the, the larger worldview and, and i think that's that's still important to keep in mind because a lot of folks feel that it's unethical to teach indigenous worldview. Um, and you know, we need allies. Fool's Crow, one of the, the most respected of the Lakota uh, shamans, was, was famously quoted and, and, and has said, and others have repeated it, that those who do not share this medicine do not know it. And so, although you have to appreciate the problems of misappropriation of indigeneity, um, the, the, and, and as I said, the place-based knowledge can only be taught by people who know the language fluently, etc. Uh, all of us, though, are indigenous to this this universe, this planet. And the more allies that we have, the better. So don't let the ethics of well, I'm not indigenous, therefore I can't, you know, with good heart share the wisdom of, that I've read here or, or that I've learned here. If possible, bring in local people, but that's not very practical in most cases. So 
So I think the ethics has these, these two sides. And that indigenous research holds profound importance today because it brings this holistic place-based knowledge system and the larger worldview that they have in common, the great unique differences in the spiritual traditions of different First Nations. And, and it challenges the dominant colonial paradigm. And we have to do that. It's about community. It's about reciprocity and sustainability um, and, and, and mostly respect and justice. And so this comes through you know, methods uh, I write about in my book, The Authentic Dissertation, Alternative Ways of Knowing, Research, and Representation. Uh, one of the, I, I put a call out to 200 and I put a call out internationally or you know, for anyone who had trouble getting their dissertation through committee, and uh, but got it through committee and won an award for it. And I got about 240 responses. Only 20% from the United States, which I think is interesting. And uh, the you know, and, and they're art arts based and, and indigenous based, and uh, and I have a, a an indigenous host and a Western host that are fictional, introducing these actual people telling why they did the kind of approach that they did to research. And then I have famous scholars like Elliot Eisner and, and others that, that come into the conversation and, 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 and argue it. So, um, and there's no APA citations in the whole book, right? So I tried to walk that talk. But um, some of the research methods uh, were invented. For example, one person said, you know, the way I want to answer my research question is, Sort of how my uncle used to decide what kind of lure to use to catch a fish, what kind of a, of a fly to make. He would take a can and he would wrap it in bear grease and then he would drop it into the river and he would lift up that can and see what insects are sticking to it. And then he would make the fly replicate that thing. So he wound up doing a dissertation and he had a hard time getting it through committee where his research methodology was tin can bear fat methodology, right? And it won an award, you know? And so we've got to think independently. Uh, we, have to, we, have to, we have to look at all the things that, that, that all of our speakers have talked about uh, from, uh, from Adler's talking about recognizing how we really have to get through these, these hegemonic filters. And uh, what Edgar talked about with, uh, with this idea of free uh, and fun uh, expression, because that, that's what stimulates curiosity. But there's all kinds of ways, storytelling and community-based research and uh, relational accountability, land-based research, um, place-based research, autoethnography, where our stories and our, and our discovery of who we are in a particular research approach are, are, I think, the, the most powerful. Um, and of course, uh, uh, decolonizing uh, along, along the way. Um, I'll leave it to someone else to answer. Thank you so much for Eros. Edgar, your thoughts on you know, how we can bring in a research in this reimagined, uh, an ethic in this reimagined research paradigm? I was trying to, to bring the best way of responding that. And I had two, I got two images. So I start from that, like usually I divide. So after seeing so many miracles happen, when you have a crowd playing the change, not fighting, not marching, not uh, advertising, but playing the change. I saw that this thing, when I, when I say like, when I say like ordinary and extraordinary, actually dividing three, three octavas, like octavas of musical octavas, so you have the, our ordinary version is the, the first octava. There's a second one. You go to, you climb a level, another level where things start to become magic. You remember, as we kind of naturally, intuitively, we know what I'm talking about. Like we know when you go to another level, when you some, sometimes you're having, you're having camping with your friends and you lose the notion of time. You maybe you're there for three days and you think, oh, it's, it looks like three weeks, right? Sometimes like that, that moment, or maybe in a, in a concert, and you see that kind of happening, right? The kind of vibration come to you. And then the third October, when things become real magic. So when you talk about playfulness, or uh, think about like the whole, the crowd, the collective, collective climbing, 
ethic is just there. And that's why I say, when I think about that, it's like, how can I catch, how can I catch, share some images? And I thought about two of them. One is a jam session. When you see the musicians, so you have the musicians, the ordinary version, they can play music, right? The second level, they can like, they can make us goosebumps. Like they say like, oh, what, what the concert? What, you know, you don't want to move. Like you look to your friends and you, you, you smile. Like you, you know, I've seen, I've been in that, but that kind of magic. And that is the, the one that we go, we transcend. So they transcend and we transcend together. It's not a concert anymore. We're not in that space anymore. And that's as reached by the gem session. So we have those in many different cultures. I'll talk about some that we, uh, we can collectively figure out. So the musicians, they say that they have to be a very good musician to play a gem session because it's not about, you're not allowed to follow, you know, uh, uh, the, the lines that you have to feel. This is about soul. You're so vibing singing. In that level, ethic is there. We don't need agreement. Uh, the question that you brought, you know, ethic in a very large sense, we don't need to think about how can we protect ourselves? What kind of agreement are you going to do? That? So we naturally, we vibe. If you see the people's face, the, the musician's face, there's no need of anything else. It's all there. So, so the, how can we, even the notion of, of rules, of, uh, of uh, moral and even ethics is built, is designed in a way that like it's trying to protect something from ours. So when we create uh, suspiciousness among us, when this, we have to protect something, like in many of indigenous community we know in the past, they, they didn't have that. I, I, I studied much more in Brazil, right? They say that it's written in Portuguese, Portuguese letters. They say that, oh, we arrived in the beach and they came to embrace us, to give us food, to touch our hands, to touch our, you know, they were afraid that they could like beat them, the indigenous, but they were not aggressive at all. They said that like, maybe they, they saw us before. Like they said that in the letters, in the Portuguese letters, they say like, maybe someone came before, but no, the idea of the different, the idea of the different was so exciting as it, as it is for kids. Like it's so different that I go for it. Like I want to touch and say, oh, how it smells, how it's touched, how you know, what happened? So it's, so we go to it, like it's not, the idea of the different is not, uh, 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 how I say in English, it's not a risk, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a curiosity. And for us, somehow, after so many years of colonialism and many other stuff, imperialism, we, the different is becomes, we first, is, is, is a, a possibility of danger. And before it was a possibility of joy, a connection. They may, they may have different songs, they may have different movement, they may have different food. Let's go to, touch them together and share, right? So those are aspects that we need to think about when we bring, especially reimagining, right? Research and even even uh, uh, ethics, it could be about that. My second image, I wanna uh, finish with that so I don't have some time. We have like, uh, when I observe that, it's not just an idea, an ideal, but for example, when I think, when I talk about uh, playfulness, collective playfulness, here in Brazil, we have a kind of community game, a kind of game that we call Gincana. In Portuguese, Gincana, Portuguese Gincana. But Jinkana, and Jinkana is a game where, where the whole town, a whole city come together once in, once in a year, it's not carnival. The whole city come together for two days and we play silly, impossible mission all together for many, many years. It's dying now. In the past, when I was a kid, like many, many cities in Brazil, they play. Now maybe 20 cities from the, the 2000, the 5,000 ones that you have, maybe 20, it's dying. But it's a game that the whole town come together, mothers, grandmas, the priests, the religious, everybody come together. So we play city possible mission. What do you mean that you got city possible mission? It comes from very simple ones. For example, the guys, that, the organizers, they say, you have three minutes to, to bring the, the largest shoes in town. Just three minutes. And then you run and people, rah, 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 rah. and they always bring like many shoes. They're like, there's no time. But people always bring the time, right? Or the most crazy car. But there's, a, there's amazing, uh, missions that I love, for example, the first one that I play, they say, okay, guys, you have three hours to bring a real pink elephant, right? And then I was, I remember that was uh, my first time, I was 12 years old, I say, what? Then I stand up, people like, when, it, when they come to the state to raise the question, the mission, people go like, oh my gosh, okay, it's coming, it's coming, right? And I say, okay, three hours to bring a real pink elephant. And you know, there's no elephant in Brazil, right? And there's no pink elephant anywhere, but people don't care. When they say three hours, people start to run and run, like run and run and laughing and laughing because we're expecting, like the Beijing Khan is all about silly, impossible mission. Don't bring hard missions. If you bring a hard mission, you say, oh, no, no. 
because we know they're gonna feel good, right? But it's, it's impossible. After two hours, they brought it in the punch. Because someone, after running around, how oh my gosh, you're gonna do that? Someone screaming like after three minutes, people say like, circles, the circles. Someone in real life, okay, circles. We don't have elephants in Brazil, but the circles in Brazil, we have elephants. And then as soon as they say circles, motorbikes, you could see, hear the sound of motorbikes running around. But, and I said, come on, there's no circles in the city. They don't care. They go to another town, right? There's, when I was 12 years old, there was no internet, no Google. The people don't care. They go around and say, like, did the search faster here? So they found the circle six cities ahead. They convinced the circle's owner because everybody knows in Brazil it's Gincana. They say, give me your elephant. No, no, don't touch my elephant. It's Gincana, Gincana, take it, take it, but bring it back. So everybody gives. You know, like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an honor code. If you add Jinkana, give it away. No discuss, right? Because people want to play the false formation. Whatever. After two hours, people brought a, a gray elephant. Yeah, there's no pink, right? Say, so, oh, at least half of the points are sour. They celebrated. And the guys in the, in, in the state say, no, 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 it's not pink. Even the guys that the guys that invented the pink elephant, they, they thought it's impossible. We have to try to decide something possible, right? The people. The, they, they even they say like I can't believe they brought the elephant, but it was great. Say, they have to be brave. No, it's not big. After half an hour, before the three hours, another team brought the second elephant. It's a gray elephant, but there are twelve people over the elephant painting pink. Right? The whole elephant pink, right? And the whole town is cracking. You know, we rode everybody. The whole city. We laugh. We rode the floor. We celebrate. We put, right? In the back, they, they bought the pink elephant. They, they painted, and the guy say, "Okay, they won." Is a real pink. Nobody told you could not pink, right? Is a real, it's a pink. So after that, right? So for you to have an idea, in Brazil, we have those kind of crazy stuff. When I say in that level, it's so much joy that all teams, I, I, I didn't told you, the teams have 500,000 people, each team, 10,000 10, people in each team, right? It's a lot, it's big, big teams. It's a whole neighborhood, the whole town. But everybody clap, everybody celebrate because the whole game is about how can, that's important. How can we research the best version of ourselves? How can we try it on? How can we see what is the higher level that we together against this team, the organizing team, is the whole time against them? Bring it impossible. Bring it on. Let's see. And we all conclude that. It's, it's really, it's, I never saw, I myself never saw a, a, a question, a mission, impossible mission that was not fulfilled by the whole town. It's the whole collect. So when I talk about research, reimagining research, I would say that something like that. How can something connected with jump session, what are these guys researching? What are they reaching, reaching and making it available and touching and sharing it straight away. When they are playing, it's not just for themselves, for the whole crowd. We all go into a trance together. We all elevate our consciousness. We all go to another level. So how can we call, as indigenous people in Brazil, they say, the future is ancestral. I love that. The indigenous from Amazonia, they're saying the future is ancestral. How can we go back to this higher level before imperialism, before colonialism, to call that back, the collective notion and share, share it with nature, with people from all, everywhere and make it available and joyful and playful and accessible for everybody. Thank you so much, Edgar. I already feel the miracle and the magic in this collective jam session that brings out the uh, best version of ourselves on a collective level. Uh, we've got five minutes, and Adler, uh, perhaps you'd just like to add something into that reimagined space, that epic, as we reach towards a closing. Thank you so much for Arrows. Uh, thank you so thank much you so for much. blessing us with your wisdom. Yeah, I, I, I noticed that I spoke too long, so I'll shorten, I'll, I'll be more short a little bit right now. Um, and I realized the beauty of our cross-cultural exchange here. I, I sensed the transnatural from Four Arrows, uh, Four Arrows indigenous background. I sensed the playfulness and joyfulness, the, the Brazil energy <laughs> from Edgar and maybe some sort of um, um, serious humanism from East Asian tradition culture. And I think um, one of the things that I'm exploring uh, is to, relevant to this question is um, how does the 
the non-dual um, East Asian philosophies informed research. And I found that it's not just originally before you asked this question, I thought those would be uh, some sort of research principles or maybe methodologies, but I found that since it's non-dual, it's also ethics. So what are they exactly from from Mahayana Buddhism? Uh, there is a very important concept saying that all troubles, all perplexities, or all worries, um, depending how it, it depends on how you translate it. But basically, the the distress that you encounter are bodhisattva or enlightenment or awakening. Um, I think it. It is very true to my case is that my personal experience with my old friend, that uh, shocking moment, and my deep concern and deep care for her, uh, led to that epiphany and led to this fifteen-year journey, and and look like deeply diving into that worry or that deeply deep deeply diving into that distress or care, uh, it leads to so much enlightenment. It looks inwards. And also another, another philosophy from Confucianism is that um, there is a, there is a, um, I think it's in the great learning. Um, it says that your personal Mm. Your personal, mm. it's hard to translate, but basically your uh, deep, deep, your, your deep engaged, but also moral practice as a humane person would be that you there are, a, there are a couple of levels. Um, one is that you get to know something very deeply. Through that, knowing deeply, you get wisdom. And my understanding of that is that you understand you understand something very thoroughly that the, the wisdom arises from that, that guides, gu that provides guide to your living, your actions and also further knowledge and then sorry Adla, um, um sorry to disturb you we uh, need to give over the room in uh in a minute um okay. so if you could wrap up thank you so much sorry okay i'll wrap up here mm -hmm. so there's the knowing part and also how do we become genuine and after you become and also the genuinity is there and you um you act upright and eventually it emerges to systemic social transformation so there is a there's a path in confucianism that leads from that uh, research and uh, ethical act into the transformation for the greater society for better and i think it's not just a research method then with your question i think it's also research ethics Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our panelists, for Eros, who has had to leave us, to Edgard from Brazil, and to Adler, who's currently in Japan, um, you know, just for sharing all your deep insights on how to reimagine research. I think we've gone everywhere from trance to this transcendental state, to playfulness, to a collective jam session, to miracles, and to emergence, and co-being, and uh, coexistence. So, giving gratitude to you all. Thank you for helping us to continue in this space of reimagination, bringing forth the goddess, I believe, um, alive. And